after having several conversations with some close friends these, this week and some people that I had been praying for and had been ministering to, it came to my understanding that maybe it's the best way, maybe this is a good time to put out a, a ministry 101, kind of a, kind of a gospel 101 message. The, the nuts and bolts of why Jesus came and died for us, why that's important, why it's important in this day now, why you need to have it, why it needs to be put in your heart, why you need to, to be able to understand and, and revisit it and share it with other people. Jesus told us, go and make disciples, telling them all the things that I have shown you, and I will be with you until the end of the age. That was Jesus' mandate to those who believe in him. They needed to go and talk about him. They needed to go talk about their testimony of what God, what Jesus had done in their lives. And if you have a heart to share the gospel, if you have a heart to understand, to know God better, to show your love for God more, then this is what we need to know. And so I'd like to give an orderly understanding of the gospel message. Now, it can't be exhaustive because, well, the entire Bible is the gospel message. Although Jesus is not mentioned by his name, a man who died on a cross in the Old Testament, there are foreshadowings and pictures and prophecies and, 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 um, and models that all set perfectly exactly what needed to be said so that by the time Jesus came in the very perfect time and the very perfect place to die for you and me, that, that those who truly understood the Old Testament would understand who Jesus was and why he came and why it's interesting and, un, and it's why it's important for us to understand these things. And so as we start, we start at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, God made people. He made everything. And the triune God is sitting there. They make heaven and earth, light and stars, and the sun, and the animals, and the seas. And they made people. People made out of the dust. The reason was that God needed someone that he could, he could relate to. Someone he could love, and they would love him back. Someone who had the ability to make some decisions. Somebody who had a morality, a moral compass and creativity and understanding because God talking to the rabbit in my front yard over here. Uh, I've tried to talk to the rabbit in the front yard. He doesn't. He's not much of a, of a conversationalist. But the Bible tells us that God made man in his own image. And what that means is, is that we were given a, a very specific freedom to think for ourselves, to decide for ourselves, to decide what's right and wrong, to be creative, to be more like God than anything else he'd ever made. Even the angels don't have any premise to think for themselves. They either do or they're destroyed. We have a tremendous uh, God who created us in a tremendously freeing way. But with freedom comes some responsibility. See, God knew that he couldn't make you love him. God needed to give you the free will to say, either I love him or I have the right to walk away from him. And a lot of people will tell you God sends people to hell. No, it's not true. God wishes for everyone to be saved, to, to, to get cleared of their sins and come to him and understand him and, and love him. If you don't want to be with God now, why would you want to be in God with God in eternity? And he allows you to make your choice. He allows you to walk away from him if you wish. My wife loves me. And I know that the value of her love is, in, is proportional to the value of her deciding she can walk away at any time and leave me here by myself. That's love. God makes us in his image. And he makes it, by the way, at the end of chapter 1, verse 31, it says, Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. And so creation is made. Men are made. Men are very good, which means we're 
We're perfect. We were perfect, genetically perfect, and we were sinless. We didn't understand evil. There wasn't any evil to understand. God knew that, but at that point, everything was made perfectly. It's not until Romans chapter 5, verse 12 tells us that when Adam brought sin into the camp, when Adam rebelled against God by eating the fruit, breaking the one rule, the rebellious rule that God had said, don't eat of that tree. That's the only thing you have to do to prove to me you love me is to keep my commandments, my one commandment. Don't eat that, don't eat that fruit. Don't do that. And of course, Eve does it. Adam does it and plunges the world into sin, into rebellion. And, and Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, he brought death and sin and sickness and decrepitation into this world. And if you read Romans 8, it talks about even, even all of creation groans in the sinfulness of Adam and the sinfulness of men because as we brought sin into the world, sin came to the whole world. And so trees died and animals ate each other and bad things happened. They're waiting for Jesus to come and reveal his sons, his perfect sons of God, his sons and daughters, sinless because they had been refined and had been sanctified and justified and glorified in the name of Jesus Christ. So as we get to Genesis chapter 3, uh, Eve is told by the serpent that she should eat the, the fruit. And she says, okay, it says in verse 4, it says, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. No, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced, deceived, by the king of lies, Satan himself, who twisted the words. He said, earlier in here, he says, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden? Did he not say? This has been the, this has been the attack of Satan ever since day one. To question God's word. Did God really say? Did God really say? Did God really say? Did he really say that about marriage? Did he really say that about relationships of, marriage, of, of gender issues? Did he really say about, about, about the death of the innocent? Did he really say? So many people have fallen into this now. And he brings this lie to Eve. And Eve says, well, I'm convinced that, that I can be my own God. I can rebel against, I don't need him anymore. I can be my own God. Pride came into the fold. Did he really say? Be careful because Satan knows the word better than you do. He can twist that word and make it sound religious. There's whole religions now based on the fact it's called mystical Gnosticism. It's the belief that Satan is the good guy freeing you from that terrible God who was holding you back and holding you down in the prison planet. Look into it. It's, uh, it's the, the new age Gnosticism. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. And so she took some of the fruit and she ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was her, uh, was with her and he ate it too. And at the moment their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now here's the thing. Eve sees this tree. It's beautiful. It has everything she ever wanted. But just because it's beautiful doesn't mean it's bad. Doesn't mean it's good. We have to be careful about what we fall into because the, the enemy is always around the corner looking to deceive us. When we wish to have something and put it in our heart, it becomes idolatrous. James chapter 1 verse 14 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And that's the crux of the whole point. Sin came into the world when they rebelled against God. So much so that at the, before they had done this, they were naked and they were unashamed. The Bible tells us that clearly in the last chapter. And now they're ashamed of their nakedness because they understand good and evil. There has been a 
a, a, a metamorphosis, a transfer of, of knowledge in this case. And that knowledge was not good knowledge. It was dangerous and decrepit knowledge. And so what they do is they take, they take fig leaves together and they sew it up to cover their nakedness. What we'll find out later is man cannot cover their own sins. We don't have the ability. You think you're, you think you're a good person and that you're not a sinner. And we'll talk about the, what the Bible says about that. And it's not my definition. It's exactly what God is saying. But we can't cover over our sins by our own actions. I can't go out and cover my sins by doing good things. I can't take fig leaves and I can't sew them all together to cover myself up. It doesn't work. Verse 8, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they, so they hid from the Lord among the trees. And then the Lord called to the man, where are you? Now here's the thing. God knows where you are. Do you know where you are? Do you know where your heart is? Do you know what decisions you've made? Do you know what direction you're going? Where are you, Adam? What have you done, Adam? He knows he's waiting for Adam to come clean. Verse 10, he replied, I, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Blame. Already blaming. More sin. <clears throat> and then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the serpent, and it goes on, the story goes on. But this is what I want to point out to you at the end here. He, he gives a curse and he starts to build he starts to build the point about how he's going to receive man back to himself after having rebelled against God. It says this, he tells the serpent, Satan, the enemy, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as you long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will, sh I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat food to eat. You will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust and to dust you will return. <clears throat> and so bad things have now happened. Curses have been made. The curse that God gives Satan is that your offspring, those who believe in you, don't believe in Jesus, don't believe in God, but are sinners and fall for you will be at enmity or will be will be against those of her seed. Now interestingly, women don't have seed. Men do. It is the man that gives the seed in the pregnancy. But in this case, her seed means that the person who comes out of her will be made by the Holy Spirit himself. Men will not, a man will not give seed. It will be an immaculate conception. So God has already made the, the deal. I'm going to send someone. He's going to come from a virgin and that person is going to smash your head. He's going to defeat you because you have killed my you have destroyed my creation you have you have brought my people out of rebellion and that's a problem but i want to show you one more thing before we move on it's very very important <clears throat> then the man adam named his wife eve because she was to be the mother of all who live and the lord made 
clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Animal skins. Remember, she tried. they tried to sew together some fig leaves to cover over their nakedness, but God killed an animal and made clothing. And this is the beginning of the redemption story. That something who didn't, wasn't involved in your wickedness had to die, had to shed blood so that you could be covered of your sins. This is the beginning of the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, as we go forward in time, Genesis 22 leaves us with a man named Abraham. And Abraham was called by God to become the people of Israel. God needed a, a group of people to live for God again because Adam and Eve chose not to. At this point, there isn't any law, so people are dying of their sins, but sin is just ravaging the world, so much so that God has to destroy them in a flood. He decides he's going to kill everything that's walking on the earth, everything that's living, except for eight people, because Noah was a man of righteousness. And so Noah and his wife and his three sons and their three wives are the only people who are who are smart enough to get into the ark that takes 120 years to build. It had never rained, and Abraham, being a man of righteousness, had been, had been talking to the world about sin, but they didn't want to listen. They wanted to do their own thing. And at that point, wickedness was tremendous in the earth. If you read through Genesis chapter 6, you'll see it. So much so that God says, you know what, I'm sorry I made man, I'm going to destroy him. But Noah found favor. And so God said, Noah, build this boat. Everybody get in there. Take some animals. I'm going to kill everything that doesn't get in there. And God shuts them in. Eight people survive. All others are destroyed by God's judgment. Well, Abraham is called after that. It's been a few hundred years. Abraham is called to become the man of, of a nation of Israel. And at some point, he, uh, he's told that he's going to have a son. It takes a long time to have that son. And finally, that son is of age. <clears throat> and God goes to him and says, I need you to sacrifice your son. And so in chapter 22, it says, so uh, verse 5, Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. And so Abraham placed the wood of the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, a four, a four picture of carrying the cross, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them walked on together. Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood. The boy said, where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Verse 8, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. Now, interestingly, in the New King James Version, or even in the Old King James Version, the way that it is depicted in verse 8 is a little bit different. It says in, that, in those other versions, it says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. God will provide a sacrifice. Not men, not what we do, nothing we, that we do can make us better. God will provide the sacrifice to save us from our sins. Verse 9, when they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. And then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in it by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it to the burnt offering place of his son. Abraham placed, uh, named the place Yahweh Yaira which means the Lord will provide. And to this day, people who still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. A beautiful picture of the gospel set in Genesis himself. Abraham, his father, takes the chosen son, Isaac, and he takes him up to sacrifice him to the Lord. Now, here's a couple of things. Abraham at this point is in his hundreds, and we know that Isaac is about 30 years old. There's no way Isaac can't overpower his father in this, but he allows his father to tie him up and lay him down on the altar, believing that he was doing God's work 
a picture of later on when God says, I have sent my only son. He willingly came here to die for your sins, to be sacrificed, covered in a minute. <clears throat> we need to talk about sin. Because after Adam and Eve rebelled against them, they had sinned. The sin is the word. Now, sin is an interesting word. It's an archery word. What it means is, is if I shoot an arrow at a, at a target and I miss the bullseye, I've committed a sin. I miss the mark. So many people, so many churches don't want to talk about sin anymore. They don't want to use the word because somehow it puts people off. That's all it is. It's just missing the mark, making a mistake. God has a perfect will for your life. And if you make something against his will, then you made a mistake and it's okay. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says all have fallen short, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have fallen short and fallen short and, 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 and we have all sinned. Every man has sinned. Why that is, is because Adam, Adam was the man of sin. He had genetically changed into a sinful person that's in the blood of the man. And the man then, well, he was the father of all people. And so we're born sinners. You never have to teach a child how to lie or steal. They already know it inherently how to do that. In their pride and in their wants and in their covetousness. All these things are, are easy. So we have to handle sin so that we can stand before a righteous God because a righteous God can't have anything to do with a man who is a sinner. Even the Bible says, even the good things we do for people are like filthy rags to God. There's no way. We cannot do it. And so at this point, there's no law yet. So you don't know that you're sinning, but people are dying because they're sinners. Thank goodness that God didn't allow Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the eternal life. Because then we would have eaten and had eternal life in the midst of this rebellious, sinful, wicked nature. And that wasn't God's heart. He wanted us to be righteous and holy before him so we could live without pain and fear and death and hatred and violence. That's, that was his perfect plan messed up by man's rebellion. So now we see Abraham who then who then has this ability, he has this picture of his son. And here it is. You have to sacrifice your son for the sins of the world. You have to sacrifice your blood, sacrifice, death, innocence, has to cover over sins. And so when we get into, uh, when we get into Leviticus, Moses has brought the children of Egypt out of Exodus. A good thousand, a couple thousand years have passed now. Leviticus now is the part of the law. And Moses is writing the law. And in Leviticus, God says, God says, here's how you need to cover over your sins. You need to, you need to sacrifice an animal. And that animal has to bleed. And you have to take that blood and you have to put it all over the altar. That will cover over your sacrifices. So if you sinned against God... If you sinned against God and God said, uh, this is a sin and now you're not covered, you had to take an animal, an innocent animal, you had to kill the animal and you had to bleed on the sacrifice to cover your sin so that you could be back with God. The point is, though, is that a, a lamb or a goat or an ox cannot cover a man's sin. It can cover over, but it cannot relinquish, it can't vanquish sin for good because it's not a man. You have to, a man's blood has to be shed for a man, for that has to be there. A sinless man, a man who gave his life. You see the part of where Jesus is coming. Sin became a very difficult problem, and it continues to be to that, that point and that place. So after Leviticus, we have all of these offerings, sin offerings and burn offerings, where animals had to die and blood had to be shed to cover over the nation's sin. Because Jesus hadn't been born yet. Jesus hadn't died yet. He hadn't covered over the man's sin at this point. And so there's these thousands of years where God just said, well, here's a program that will kind of put a Band-Aid over it, but it can't handle it perfectly. If we turn to Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 9 and 10, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, we, we, see, we see what he tells us. Um, uh, chapter 9, verse 19 says, And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. That's a part of it. But as you look back at 9, chapter 9, verse 
28, it says, So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly awaiting him. <clears throat> 922 tells us that the shit that, that, that for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Your sins can't be forgiven without the shedding of blood, but it has to be shed by the right person, the right situation, the right offering so that it can be covered. Jesus is that offering because he came a sinless man, not born of Adam, but he came as the son of God and he gave himself willingly being murdered on a cross to, to be injured, right? That our injuries, that his stripes would heal our sinfulness. But chapter 10 is really interesting. It says the old system under the law of Moses, we talked about in Leviticus, was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they came having, if, if they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. And then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. Well, first, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them. Though they were required by the law of Moses in the book of Leviticus, then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstep under his feet. For by the one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I have made. With my people on that day, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he says, I will never remember, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so, dear brethren, uh, brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus by his death. Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us do go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. That's the point. In the book of Leviticus, in the Old Testament, Jesus is never mentioned because Jesus hadn't been born yet. He, he came at a perfect time to die. Adam had sinned and had created a lineage of people who were sinners. And God had made a program, a covenant in blood, that blood had to be shed for the life of the living so that you could be made whole with God, but it only covered over. It was only a sheet over your sins. It didn't vanquish it completely. And so you had to do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for, for thousands of years. Now in Judaism today, they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They're still waiting for their Messiah. And so they're clamoring and have been for a while to rebuild a temple so that they can continue animal sacrifices 
These people don't understand that Jesus came and wiped out their, their sins already. He had already died the blood of a man who gave it them the freedom, but they don't want to believe in it. And that's why the seven-year tribulation comes, is because they don't believe that Jesus was the Christ. And because they don't believe he's the Christ, they're going to fall for the Antichrist, who's going to come in here in a great, uh, a great perilous, um, horrible time. A seven-year tribulation is going to happen. But... Those who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, who have given their life over to him because the gospel of Jesus Christ has wiped our sins clean, well, we can go to heaven because we have been cleansed and we can sit before God and we can understand God and be with God because we were not, we're not sinners anymore, not seen through because God sees us through a, through a lens and through that lens is he sees Jesus on top of us. He knows that Jesus' blood rests on us, that we can be free. The Bible, <clears throat> the Bible tells us the transaction that he who knew no sin became sin so that those who are sinners could become the righteousness in Christ Jesus. What a transaction. That he came without sin, that he died for your sins so that you would be cleansed of your sins and then you would be just like Jesus so that you could go and be with the Father in heaven, having been restored and reflected back to the just before the fall when Adam and Eve were perfected before God. See, you have to see it this way. You're, you're, sitting, you're sitting, everything you've done, you have sinned a million times in your life. There's, and if you don't think you're sinning, you're sinning now. <clears throat> and so you have to stand trial <clears throat> because God is a... God is a just God, and God can't, he can't deal with your sins. You have to reconcile it. So the sins have to be paid for. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says the wages of sin is death. That means that because you've sinned against a righteous God, you don't have any ability to go back to him. You have, you've blown it. You messed it up. And whether you're covering it over with sinful sacrifices, with sacrifices of animals and blood, it doesn't cover it. It doesn't work. And so your sins have, have damned you to death. And in this case, the physical death in the world, everyone has to go through unless you've taken up in the rapture. The death he's talking about is spiritual separation from, a, from the God who gives you all good things. See, even the wicked are blessed by God in many ways. But when you will be separated from a, from a holy and just and loving God, you'll have nothing. And so God has come up with this point. <clears throat> He's come up with this way. And he went to his son and he said, I need to find a way to fix this problem so that I don't have to tolerate, I can't change my personality, and I don't tolerate sins, because if I tolerate sins, then I, I go against my personality, and I can't do that, because God can't change, God can't lie, God can't, God is the great I am, and he's unchangeable and unfathomable, he's so powerful and so knowledgeable. So he can't go against himself by allowing you to get into heaven with all your sins. But he needed to make a way so that he could, you could pay that bill and you could still make it. That you could deal with the death of your sins and at the same time be righteous enough to make it to heaven. Well, that's why Jesus came. Jesus, part of the triune God, took on human form. He needed to be human and he couldn't be born of a, of a, he couldn't be born of a man because then he would inherently be a sinner. And a sinner can't die for the sinless. A, a sinner can't die for other sinners. It, it doesn't work that way. Jesus had to live a whole entire life of being sinless. That's why John the Baptist says, here comes the Lamb of God that, that came to take away the sins of the world. He came, was born of a virgin. That is, he wasn't, he didn't have the blood of Adam. And then he needed to live 33 years of sinless life, which he did. We know this because in the Mount of Transfiguration, when he's up on the hill and he glows white and he's hanging out with Moses and Elijah, who resurrected from wherever they came from to talk to him, the law and the, 
and the prophets, that God said, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. Back to the point in Genesis when all things are very good. Here's, here's Jesus who I am very pleased with what he's done. He has proven himself to be the sinless man I needed him to be. And now he needs to go and die <clears throat> to take away the sins of the world. There's so much to this story. This is truly what love is. Because God loves you. He is love. Therefore, we can love others because he first loved us. First John tells us that. And so that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You sinned and you have fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And so he came down here to give himself to pay the bill. It would be this. You're, you're standing in court and you're defending yourself. You don't have a defense attorney. Uh, or maybe you do. It, it, it depends. Is Jesus your defense attorney? Or are you defending yourself in court against your sins? Jesus says, I'll take care of your sins for you if you just believe in me, if you hire me, if you bring me into your heart and give me, let me be your savior, I'll defend you in court but to my, my father or in the judgment seat at the end of the seven-year tribulation, you can go before him by yourself. Now, here's the problem. There's too much evidence to your sinfulness. He'll pop the book open and the book will tell him everything you ever did in your whole life, everything you said, everything you thought, everything you did, all the sins. And it'll be very clearly that it's an open and shut case because God is omniscient and omnipresent. And so he will tell you that you are guilty and the wage of the sin, that your punishment for sin is death. But Jesus will say, hey, Dad, <laughs> Father, I, you know the, what I have done. I have made a sacrifice for this man because I was sinless and I gave my life so that his sins would be paid off. I took the punishment upon myself so that he wouldn't have to. And, G, and, and God will look at his son and say, then I don't have anything against you. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's what we're looking for, to enter into the joy of the Lord. So that's the gospel. Gospel is simply plain. John 14 verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Lots of religions out there, they're all works-based. It's all about how much good you do and do you do more good than bad and how do you know you're going to sin? How do you know you're going to go to heaven that way? You don't because there's no way to know. But I can be, I can be promised I can be promised of what it means to go to heaven because the Bible tells me that all I have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and I'll be saved. To believe Jesus is the one who came and he, he died for me so that I could be made right. He who knew no sin became sin so that those who were sinners, me who has been a sinner, would then be righteous in the midst of our Lord and in the midst of the Father God. So if you've never accepted Jesus, if you haven't taken up that mantle, if you continue to believe that all of this stuff is a bunch of hogwash, but you, you're, you're tripped to the bone here, your heart is grabbed to and grabbed onto, then to accept Jesus is really easy because we can pray. And if you don't know what praying is, it's talking to God as if I'm talking to you now. And you can say something like this. You can say, Father, I know that I'm, I realize I'm a sinner. I realize that I have sinned against you, a righteous God. And I, and I know that I have to deal with the punishment. I also know you sent your son to die for me so that I wouldn't have to. And I pray that you would give me your son, the Holy Spirit upon my life, so that I could be saved that I could have a savior, that I could love you and worship you and praise you all the days of my life, to give my life over so that I would not be, I wouldn't fall into sin again. It's called repentance. Repentance is simply doing a 180 degree turn and walking away from your sinful behavior. That's all it's asking for. Ask for forgiveness. Believe that Jesus is raised from the grave and you'll be saved. That's, that's the Bible. That's the gospel. Men sinned. You're a sinner. You need to get the red out of your ledger 
and Jesus came to remove the red and put you back in the black, put you back in the positive so that you could seek after God. But your work is, is that you need to know God. You need to know Jesus as your Savior because John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I hope this helps. Share it with everybody you know that doesn't know what the gospel is. I hope this video brings some positive energy in the midst of things prophetically happening out here. That means the rapture is close because Jesus, who is the bridegroom, will come back to the bride of the church, those who believe in Jesus, and will take us back to live with him forever and ever. And we get to miss all the rest of, of everything, be, having been given over to the bride of Christ. Be good this week. Seek him while you still can. Because the Lord loves you. God loves you. He loves you so much that he made a plan to save your life. His son decided he would willingly give himself so that you could be saved, so that we can all be together for eternity in heaven and on earth. I love you so much. You guys have a great Christmas and be blessed.